بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا فما بعده ما بعد سترز we come to the last part of the series of four things on the importance and of learning Islam in an experiential way. And I want to bring you back to the first one where I was telling you that I am videoing this in Ashley Reservoir and essentially the scenes that you're seeing are the scenes that I'm seeing because I'm videoing them. So obviously I'm not seeing something different from you. But my experience of this is completely and totally different from yours because you are just seeing these on video whereas I am walking through the park and walking through the jungle uh, as it as it is, I mean, you know, it's not a great big jungle, but it's still a, a bit of a nice bit forest. Um, so obviously my experience of this is very different, much richer, because I can smell the smells. Uh, I can actually see when I see a little rabbit that I'm photographing, which is coming in the video, then I can see the tension in his face. Uh, he's not sure what I will do, and of course I will do nothing, uh, but he doesn't know that. So, you know, I mean, I, there's a very big difference, and that has to do with living that reality. And this is what I want to um, say to you, you and remind myself, is that at the end, Islam is the name of a practice. It is not a theology, it's not a philosophy, it's not a theory. It's not a nice to know thing. It is the name of a practice. And like any practice, whether it is a diet, whether it's a working out at the gym, whether it is judo, whether it's karate, whether it is, you know, anything, a practice is only as good as it is practiced. And therefore, we do not have in Islam the concept of a non-practicing Muslim. A practice, a practice is a practice only when it is practiced. A practice can be benefited from only when it is practiced. And if you don't practice the practice, it sounds like a riddle. If you don't practice the practice, you don't benefit from the practice. Um, no such thing as a non-practicing Muslim. So, very important to understand this. So it's, and today really, if you think about it, the big problem that we have as Muslims is, and we ask ourselves, why are we suffering? Why is this? Why is that? One answer. Because we don't practice Islam. We like to talk about Islam. We like to, uh, you know, uh, discuss Islam. We like to debate about Islam. We even like to fight over Islam. We even like to make statements about who is a good Muslim and who is not a good Muslim based on, um, basically, uh, based on what suits us. Uh, who's a good Muslim? Somebody like me. Uh, who's not a good Muslim? Uh, somebody unlike me. This is the usual way of uh, assessing and it's completely and total nonsense. So, um, this is the point I want to make for myself and you that we have to understand and get over this and say that Islam is a practice and which brings us to the last one. Yatu alayhi mayatihi, recite for them the recitation, the, the, the revelation that was sent to you. Uh, purify them, prepare them to receive that revelation. Uh, teach them the book of Allah, which is the same revelation which has already been recited to them. Teach it to them because when they read it by themselves, they, are, they cannot understand it. And Allah is saying this about those for whom they were the people of the language, they were the Ashabul Lugha, they were the people of the language, yet Allah said, no, 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 this is not just about language, this is not just about Arabic, this is not just about your knowledge of Arabic or your knowledge of Arabic grammar. So what do you think one should say about somebody who does not even have that knowledge of Arabic grammar, doesn't know Arabic at all, but wants to style themselves as a teacher and a professor of the Quran, inna lillahi wa inna lillahi rajiun. Because remember, if you put yourself in that position, as I told you in the first episode, you're putting a target on your head, on your forehead and you will be questioned. You will be culpable. We ask Allah to forgive those who do this and to grant them his pardon. But if Allah wishes, then you are liable 
for punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So stop doing this. Um, stop pretending to be teachers of the Quran. Focus on applying the Quran in, in your and my life. Focus on practicing the Quran. That's what the Quran came for. It didn't come for you to teach it. It came for you to practice it and live by it. And that is the hikmah. The hikmah is what comes after practicing. To uh, stay with the example uh, of Salah, which is a beautiful example to work with. Yatlu alayhim ayatihi, Allah said, Aqeemu salah, uh, establish the salah. Yuzakki him, prepare yourself, make wudu, if you need to make ghusl, make ghusl. Um, focus on yourself, focus on your nafs, focus on your desires, focus on your heart, focus on the condition of that. And then say, once it is clear, and then say, how should I pray? Learn it from the Rasul, alayhi salam. Learn it from the Rasul. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensured that there is no other place that you can learn it from. You can't say, well, I don't need the Rasul to learn how to pray. Well, tell me where else, how else will you learn? How else will you learn? If you don't need the Rasul to teach you how to pray, how else will you learn? If you don't need the Rasul to explain to you the intricacies of fasting, what happens if you break your fast, what happens when you do that accidentally, what happens if you do it deliberately, and so on and so forth, where else will you learn it from? If you don't need the Rasul to explain to you how much of zakat to pray, and I'm talking about the pillars of Islam, the Arkan. If you don't need the Rasul to teach you what zakat is liable on <clears throat> and what it is to be and how much is to be paid, then where are you going to get that from? And if you don't need the Rasul to teach you the manasik of Hajj, the rituals of Hajj, where are you going to get it from? If you say to yourself that the Quran says, make Hajj to Baytullah, where is the mention of Arafat in Hajj, in, in the Quran? Does the Quran say that on the 9th of Dhul Hijjah you should be in Arafat? Otherwise your Hajj is not accepted, there is no Hajj. Does the Quran say that? Or did the Rasul alayhi salam say that? So even those, may Allah save us from hypocrisy. Because we become our own worst enemies and our own witnesses against ourselves when we are hypocritical. Even those who want to deny, <coughs> they go for Hajj. When you go first, tell me, where are you on the 9th of the Hijjah? Are you standing in front of a Kaaba? Saying the Quran is enough for me. The Quran says, Baitullah, Baitullah is Kaaba. So I'm going to sit in front of the Kaaba comfortably in my normal clothes because where does it say I must wear a ihram? Where does it say I must wear a, a, an ihram? Where does it say I must keep my head uncovered? Where does it say I must wear sandals which uh, leave my ankles uh, bare? Uh, where does it say that I mustn't have any, um, you know, jinsi taluk, any relationship, a sexual relationship with my spouse? Uh, where does it say any of those things? So therefore, I can do all of them. And I'm, you know, uh, the whole day and, the, and the, you know, as much as I can, I'm spending time in ibadah, I'm worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not sitting in front of the Kaaba and listening to music. I'm sitting in front of the Kaaba, I'm worshipping Allah, I'm making nawafil after nawafil. I'm praying 200,000 nawafil. Therefore, my hajj, I am a now a haji. Believe me, my brothers and sisters, call yourself what you want. You're not a haji. You're not a haji. You have violated the manasik of hajj. And you call yourself anything you like, but you have not done the Hajj. And if you do this deliberately, then you have committed kufr because you have ignored the hukum of the Rasulullah where he said, Qudu anni manasikakum. He said, take from me the manasik of Hajj. He did not say, take the manasik of Hajj from the Quran. He said, take Qudu anni. Take from me the manasik of Hajj. And that's why I remind myself and you that the hikmah is what you get out of the practice of the religion. The Quran is the name of, the, the Islam is the name of practice. And only when you practice, then you get the hikmah. Then you get the beauty of the practice of the religion. And um, therefore, uh, focus on the practice. And therefore, this is what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. He said, he then made people pray.
he then made people fast. And then they came to him and said, well, this is what's happening. When I'm praying, this is what is happening. A man came, one of the Sahaba, he came home uh, and his wife said, there's nothing to eat in the house. So we have no money. So the man goes, where do you think he went? Did he go to the bank to borrow money? Did he go to the market and say, well, you know, give me a job, please, I'm, 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 uh, I might, I might have to, I have to starve. No, he goes to the masjid. He goes to the masjid, the Nabi Sharif, and he prays two rakat of salah. Then he comes back home and he asks his wife, any change, anything happened? She said, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Uh, you went and you came back, nothing happened. The man, what does he do now? Does he say, well, okay, so I have exhausted that part of uh, my job. I've done that job. Now let me go to the bank. Now let me go and find a job. Now let me do this, that. No. He goes back to the masjid. He prays another two rakat of salah. And then he comes back. And he asks his wife, any change? And she says, this is, she says, this is amazing because something amazing is happening. She says that the pestle, the mortar, the mortar, the pestle, you know, the, the two stones that are uh, used to grind uh, wheat and barley and so on to make flour, they move on each other. He said the chakki is moving by itself and it's grinding out barley or wheat or whatever, whatever it was. This thing is moving by itself and it's grinding out the flour. And she said, well, I uh, was amazed and I said, okay, this is a good thing. So I started filling up the container. I said, she said, I filled up every container we have and it's still grinding and flour is pouring out. Now the Sahabi, the man was a man, he was a human being. So what does he do? He did what any of us would do, which is he stopped the chakki, he dismantled it to see what was going on, right? But you know, there's a benefit in staying with the miracles of Allah and not trying to understand them scientifically. <laughs> <laughs> Scientifically, if I can use the, uh, this is a good opportunity to uh, use that example. Um, so what he did was he opened the chakki and the thing stopped, stopped grinding, flowers stopped coming out of it. Now imagine him. Put yourself in that position. What would you do? He did what any one of us would do. He ran to Rasulullah. He said, "Ya Rasulullah, sallam, this is what happened to me today." You taught us to ask Allah. And I did. And I was in need and I asked Allah. And I prayed to Rakat of Salah. And then this happened. Nabi Sallallahu asked him, what did you do? He said, I went and I opened it and I tried to see what there was and it stopped. Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Wallahi, if you had not touched it, that thing would have ground out flour until the Day of Judgment. Brothers and sisters, I remind you myself, the test of the pudding is in the eating. The test of the pudding is in the eating. And unless we are willing to work and to practice Islam, nothing will change in our lives. And this is the hikmah, this is the wisdom of the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu ala nabi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'i bi rahmatika al-fadwaimi. Uh, before I be go there, there is also the reason why it's so important to learn Islam from a teacher, under a teacher, in the suhbat of a teacher, where you're not just listening to words, but you are looking at the deen being practiced by the one who is teaching you that practice. The Sahaba learned Salah not just by understanding the Faraid and the Arkan and the Mustahbat of Salah in a lecture, but by watching and seeing the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pray. They watched the prayer of the one 
who Allah made as the example. And if somebody tells me that's not important, I say, well, I have nothing more to say to you.